we're, we're going to talk about, you know, why is this kid's app and game space so difficult? And I think a big reason is because you have to make both the parent and the child happy with your marketing messages, what you're communicating otherwise, but also the product itself. Of course, there's expectations that are very different for, for both parties here. And so uh, we'll spend about 50 minutes kind of going through this. Uh, but first, I'll ask the panelists here to do a self-introduction. And then I'm going to have Alex kind of give us um, his experiences in this space over the last eight or so years of kind of what's changed and what kind of challenges we're looking at uh, today that we need to address and uh, overcome. Uh, but Christine, if you don't mind. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christine Wartink. I'm the SVP of design at Age of Learning um, and the head of the product ABC Mouse uh, for the last two years. Um, for those of you who might not know Age of Learning, we are um, a company, about 600 of us in the Glendale area, some really talented uh, engineers and designers and educators who oversee the one of the leading um, products for the pre-K to second grade market. And um, we're a mission-based company um, focusing on education. Uh, what that looks like for context is we're using about 70,000 classrooms. Um, we are available to uh, in about 50% of all public libraries free of charge to their patrons. We have about um, 6 million users, uh, uh, well I should say we, we taught over 6 million kids last year and have about had 3 billion uh, learning activities completed to date. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Elman. I'm one of the co-founders of Budge Studios. Uh, thank you, William, for putting this together. Great panel. Um, so Budge Studios, if, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a kids app publisher. We're based in Montreal, Quebec. We are 100 people. We do everything internally in our, in our Montreal studio. Uh, we develop the apps and we publish them as well. And we, we work uh, a lot with very popular kids characters um, and brands as well. Hello, my name is Alex Turetsky and uh, I run uh, IntelliJoy. Um, we've been in business since uh, early 2010, uh, which, which is a while. And um, we have, in terms of bragging rights, we, we have over 60 million downloads on uh, Google Play um, alone without having spent a dollar in uh, any marketing. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, about it some more. All right. Um, my name is Sami Kalewski. Uh, I'm a creative director at Traplight, a Finnish-based uh, free-to-play mobile company. Uh, a few years back, we released this uh, uh, Big Bang Racing, uh, which now has uh, 8 million user-created levels. And we focus on games, uh, on user turn content, and social media. So we are kind of creating kind of a mix-up of those two. Uh, yep. Thank you, Sammy. Okay, so uh, Alex, um, you've been developing in the space since I think even before Google Play, or at least around the time Google Play just came out. And so lots of things have changed, challenges, opportunities. Uh, maybe you can give us like a, a few minute kind of state of the state right now, and then I would like uh, the panel to kind of discuss uh, some of these uh, challenges and uh, opportunities that you bring up. Well, I, I guess the best way to talk about it is just uh, from you know, my, my personal uh, experience. And we basically went through three stages, or maybe I can say I personally went through three stages um, in, in this business. One was, you know, uh, can, can I quit my day job uh, type of a stage? And then the second was, you know, things were looking up, and it was more like, you know, what will I do with all that money once we make it? stage and then um, if you can't beat them, join them stage which is, I'll, I'll elaborate on. Uh, the first stage of, you know, can I quit my day job was uh, in, in the early days, going back to 2010, um, those were the days when you can, uh, you know, where quality kids apps that were educational were almost non-existent and if they were existent they were basically either fun but not educational or educational but just not fun. So it wasn't uh, as difficult, obviously, as it is now to, to invade the space. And, and then the goal was a matter of you know, trying to grab as much space uh, 
<laughs> as possible uh, by cranking out more apps and by focusing on ASO, which in those days was the wild, you know, west days of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Google. Well, it wasn't even called Google Play. It was called Android Market, and, and the ASO was very, very uh, primitive. Um, so just, you know, messing around with your app description could, could really, you know, double or triple your, your, your downloads. So those were the early days. And then um, the second stage was, you know, things were really looking up. Um, we were doing well, not just on Google Play, but also on Amazon, on, on Nook, and also there were pre-installations. And we thought, like, this thing is just about to really, you know, uh, burst, I mean, I guess in, in a good sense. Uh, but um, that didn't quite happen. And so we, we did get all those downloads, but the monetization um, continued to be a, a problem uh, for, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a long conversation uh, for what reasons, but, but, but l l let's just say that in those days, user acquisition was not a problem. Monetization was a problem. And the unique problem that, ki that we had uh, was the fact that our apps were aimed at really little kids. And those kids, if they're clicking on ads, they're doing it by, by accident. So if you are serving ads to those kids, you're, you're just basically being a bad person. Um, so, so advertising wasn't an option, and uh, you know, and and, and just uh, do, doing paid apps or in a purchases was was a uh, was not a very lucrative way to go with with kids apps uh, because the in a purchase is something that adults or, or, or teenagers usually you know take advantage of when they're in the heat of game. There's some kind of a addictive loop going on, and they're trying to buy lives and superpowers, and that's not the case with kids apps. So monetization was tough. Um, and, you know, we were experimenting with different models and we were hoping that maybe the sponsorship type model where, you know, where some brand, you know, like, like, like uh, you know, M M Mattel, I mean, Fisher Price or, or, or Hasbro will take a look at us and say, look, they, they got all these users, let's use them to, let's be a sponsor for their apps. So we were thinking, you know, it's, as, as long as we just hunker down, focus on quality, you know, uh, they will come. And then the third stage, which is a little bit of a, you know, uh, it's an interesting stage where we are right now. The monetization hasn't gotten any better. The competition has gotten greater. The ASO is, is very difficult. The Android, uh, the, the a Amazon space uh, is, uh, you know, is, is also very competitive. So it's very hard to, 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 to maintain any so, sort of a high position there. Um, there's a lot of there's, there's there's a lot of challenges. So the monetization woes are not going away. The user acquisition woes are increasing because now there's more competition. Uh, so, uh, so 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 now our uh, so now our kind of a uh, you know our main horse in, in the race is really and and really our shining uh, you know castle on the hill is really the ABC Mouse type of a uh, uh, of approach and that's where they. Uh, in a play, in, in in a space where everybody else is is really uh, is really suffering, they were able to do something that I think we'll hear more about. That I think is is quite successful by by focusing on 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 uh, on drilling down uh, the message that uh, you know that kids need to get ready for 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 first grade. Kids need to even get ready for kindergarten. And by you know, and, and and I mean it in a good sense by by, by uh, carpet bombing the airwaves with that message. I think they were successful in, in delivering that message, and I think uh, and, and, and I think that's that's something that we would like to aspire to uh, as well. And that's something that, as I'll elaborate later on, we are trying to uh, you know trying to uh, I guess to quite frankly go after. Um, and I guess we'll we'll, we'll talk about that uh, more later. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Alex, for uh, giving us a summary. But I guess my takeaway is it's always been difficult, it's just been different difficult. difficulties. But also, uh, Tom's um, speech this morning says you need to have a conservative guy on your team to make sure that you're not uh, always high in the sky. I think, Alex, you're providing a great uh, perspective of this to the panel. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of great opportunities, but at the same time, it's really tough. I mean, the more competition that there is, ASR, ASO is becoming more difficult, which was a great kind of free way. Uh, if you're good at it, to, to get users. Working with, uh, you know, the platforms was a great way, but it sounds like, you know, there's uh, more uh, competitors, you can say, that want that relationship, and there's mm -hmm. only so much uh, availability. And so, anyway, I want to uh, go around the panel here for about 10 minutes, and um, anything that Alex says that kind of resonates with, with you, uh, Michael, maybe if you can um, maybe start riffing on this. Uh, 
Sure. Um, well, on the on the subject of monetization, uh, that's obviously a huge topic uh, in the kids space. It's been a big topic this morning and in, in the earlier talks as well. Um, I think monetization in the kids space, there is not one particular method uh, on how to monetize kids apps in general because that's the there, there's multiple methods that can work and it's and it's very much dependent on the app itself. What is the age group of the app? What is the um, <clears throat> what is the value proposition of the app? How, how much content is in the app? Um, and so on. So what is the actual app itself? Is it a game? Is it uh, an educational uh, subscription? Uh, is it a creativity experience? Um, so there's, there's many, many different models that can all work. Um, ones that, and, and at Budge we have uh, over 50 apps that we've published and we've experimented and, and used. Um, all of them, uh, the, at least all the ones that I'm aware of, uh, so we have a, because we have such a big portfolio, we have a pretty interesting sort of insight into what works, what doesn't. Uh, we've tried things and, and have not worked, and we've tried things that have. Um, to speak generally about monetization in kids' apps, I think there's challenges around paid apps, uh, primarily on the uh, topic of acquiring users. Certainly with paid acquisition, that's very difficult with a paid app. Uh, it's also the, the downfall of paid apps are... Um, you don't get to really try the app and make sure your kid likes it before you buy it, and I think there's a lot of value in, in being able to make sure your kid likes it first. As a, as a publisher, there's also a, a cap to what the, the revenue is on that app, which, which is a, a problem, because once a parent pays for a paid app, they're probably more reluctant to pay more. It can be done, but there, there could be reluctance there. So um, big challenges there. Um, on the subject of monetizing with third-party ads, um, we had a talk this morning. I think it's... It's definitely uh, a method of monetization, but it certainly depends on A, the demographic, like you mentioned. If it's preschool, it, it really doesn't make any sense. Uh, if it's for older audiences, it can work, but you gotta not only be compliant, but you also need to be appropriate, uh, which is not easy whatsoever. Um, so that, that is a, but it is a possible method, you know, or at least uh, sometimes you'll do a suite of monetization options depending on what the consumers want. Maybe some of them don't wanna pay anything and there is that, sort of option, or, or they do, and you want to make sure they can remove that option. And finally, on the subscription method, um, of course, ABC Mouse being the experts in that by, by far, um, you know, we see a ton of value in that for parents. I think parents like that uh, model for all of the obvious reasons of they don't need to worry about getting content all the time because subscription apps should be continuously providing content. They don't need to worry about what the price is or if there's additional in-app purchases once their kids are in there. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a wonderful model, but of course it, you can't just put a subscription on anything. You have to have something that makes sense to subscribe to. There has to be a ton of content. It has to be coming out all the time. So I could keep going, but I could probably pass it to you on the subscription model topic. Um, sure. Um, I think it's an easy choice for us because, uh, you know, our focus is on education. And so we don't want, you know, we're creating a, an environment of trust with the parents that invest in this, in our product. And so having a place where their kids can go, they're not going to get bombarded by ads and they're really focused on learning. I think that was a really easy choice for us that we made early on. So, yeah. Yeah, since uh, I come from the free-to-play uh, world, uh, we start to monetize them usually from the from the from the target audience analysis. So so we kind of uh, create a value proposition like you mentioned. Uh, for kids, it's a little bit different. Uh, we don't mainly create kids games, but we uh, our games are played by the kids. <laughs> so so uh, uh, it seems that the collection mechanics are really really uh, something that drives uh, drives kids. Uh, um, also, also uh, since the monetization is based on game design, the collection mechanics and communication of the goals uh, is really important. So, so clear you make the goals uh, and more options you give for the, for the kids to, to kind of uh, try to go in a certain way, like with the collection mechanics, you, I want this character or something like that. Uh, that's, that's the way to kind of, uh, uh, that's my five cents. <laughs> Okay, thank you guys. Now let's go into the more of the structured uh, part of the panel here. We're going to spend uh, the next half of the time remaining on uh, designing for both uh, kids and uh, parents. And then uh, after that, marketing, um, acquiring users. And, and so, uh, Christine, if we can start with you. Uh, obviously, you guys have displayed that uh, you were able to create a product that uh, parents want for their children. 
And apparently children don't mind it because uh, your subscribers are continuing to subscribe. And I feel like if kids are not using it, that probably would not be the case. And so how are you guys able to really uh, focus on almost two different products, I think? One that really appeals to the parents, one that really appeals and engages the child. Absolutely. Uh, again, it's, it's an easy uh, uh, choice for us or an easy uh, perspective. We uh, research speaks volumes, and so that's how we keep our, both our teams real. Um, you know, in most companies, you might have an, an engineer who's um, partnered with a designer to create feature areas or content. For us, it really is a curriculum specialist uh, partnered with an engineer with a designer. Um, we have uh, rigorous user testing weekly um, on site. So we had about 500 sessions last year, about 3,000 participants of both kids and parents. And I'd like to think that they basically teach us. Um, we give them, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, joy sometimes. I've got some hotshot engineers and, and uh, high-minded designers who will come to me and say, I have a hypothesis for something that's really going to work. And, I, and I'll say, I'm not your boss. This cute little five-year-old is your boss. Uh, you need to put it in front of her and let her give you feedback on what she thinks, uh, what you think you know kind of a thing. Um, and that works really well. Um, secondarily, we, we don't put anything in the marketplace that we don't A-B test in terms of results. We've got both parent and kid KPIs that we look at consistently to make sure that we're both delivering on our learning goals as well as um, our retention goals, very important obviously. Um, and then lastly, uh, we do a lot of efficacy testings. We've got about 12 um, studies out in the marketplace. We uh, share those results, that hard data back in terms of, um, for parents, in terms of the gains we've seen in early literacy and math, as well as uh, then letting parents tell the stories themselves um, in our testimonials that we have on, you might have seen them on Disney or Nickelodeon. These are unscripted testimonials from parents who share their stories and their experiences with the ABC Mouse, which really there's no better way to reach another parent than through another parent and that recommendation. And so that's, that's been our model to date. Um, a quick follow-up, I'm sorry. And so then I'm guessing what specifically is the parent looking for? I guess it probably is the efficacy and the child is probably looking for fun. Is, is that kind of what it is? For fun, for sure. Um, and so and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about core loops and things like that later. Um, but definitely for parents, it's d does your product deliver um, the learning that you say you're going to deliver? And for kids, it's, um, you know, some of them are uh, driven by learning, and that's amazing. And some are driven by that just seems like it's a fun thing. And, I, and we do have areas for kids, both in structured and unstructured play. Um, but again, for us, you know, the goal is education, so that's our North Star, that's where we go back to consistently. I think it's great. Um, it's a great point. Like, how do we intrinsically reward a child? And of course, that is possible by saying, wow, I was able to accomplish something. Whether I'm learning and making progress, or wow, look at this beautiful racetrack, or, or this uh, uh, train track I was able to build. Because um, I think too often, I think in the kids' game space, we're like, well, how do we make this fun, you know? But really, how can you do this intrinsic rewards? And that's, I'm sure, a lot more powerful than really just earning coins and that sort of thing. Um, and so, Michael, a question for you now. Uh, similarly, of course, you have to strike this balance between parent and child. But um, whereas you're not as much focused on education, you're more focused probably on creativity, I suppose, and um, problem solving. But similarly, I mean, um, how are you able to strike this balance between parents trust it, so they uh, download it, let the child use it at the same time, the kid is using it uh, religiously. It's obviously critical that parents um, value what, what we're doing and, um, and that there is that balance that, that, that kids and parents love the apps. However, when it comes to designing the products, we don't take that into consideration as far as what the parents want. We focus purely on the kids because I give kids a lot of credit. I have kids. Uh, kids want to learn. They want to feel smart. They want to feel creative. Um, so we don't sort of look at it as, okay, we've made something that's sort of fun and, and mind-numbing and, and let's put something educational in there so parents like it. It doesn't work that way at all. Um, we, you know, kids love, depending on the age group and so on, um, imaginative play, creating things, uh, and that's not just for young kids, that's young and old, um, uh, accomplishing things and, and, and so on. So. Um, we always want to make a very uh, engaging and enriching experience for kids, and if we've done that really, really well, they will love it, and in turn, their parents will. But there's really no value in ever doing anything that's for the kids 
because of what the parents want. We design things for the parents when it comes to sort of screens that are parent focused, but anything that's kid focused is all decisions are 100% based on what, what the kids are, are, are looking for in that moment. And so for that design for the parent, what sort of things are you trying to convey with that design? Um, I suppose first you work with a lot of great IP, so it is uh, the trust that the parent already has in the IP. But also, um, is there anything else that you kind of consider to really uh, build that trust and uh, commit to the parent so they, uh, when they first open the app, they are ready to now give the app to their child? And of course, that's assuming the parents are the first ones to, to see the app. Um, they often are. Well, like you said, we do work with a lot of uh, well-known properties, so there's a certain amount of trust they have, and, and it's our job to make sure that we, that we keep that trust um, uh, by delivering an experience that is true to the brand from a quality p point of view, but also from an experience point of view. Um, whenever we're working with a big property, we really want to match up um, properly what, what the app is all about with that property, because you know we've and others have sometimes just taken a certain type of experience and figure if you put a big kid's property on top of it, it'll work. But if kids are used to uh, that property being about reading and you're teaching them math, or if, they're, uh, if it's Thomas and Friends and it's all about sort of train play and you're giving them something unrelated to that, but with those character sets, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't really seem to work. So we want, to, we want them to sort of open up the app and say this is exactly what my kids love to do with, with, this, with this property uh, in a digital representation with lots of exciting, fun things to do, and um, they'll likely be happy for their kids to be using it. Great. So I think uh, my main takeaway here is probably um, it is important that the, uh, the parent trusts your product. At the same time, you know, it's the child who will be using it, um, you know, after the parent get, gives the approval, right? And so, you know, the five-year-old cute little girl is your boss. And it sounds like that's uh, also, Michael, uh, the same way that you do. Um, so now, Alex, um, you were mentioning before that um, you're, you're doing a shift in, in business model and also product. Of course, the core product is still focused on kids, but now besides focusing on uh, a couple dozen separate individual apps, I believe most are premium, um, now you're looking at more of a subscription model. And so how does shifting your business model also affect the design of, of your product? That's a uh, great question. So we just, just for some background, we have two subscription-based apps. One is an all-in-one product where essentially we created a cross-app subscription. And I think we, at least in the kids space, we might have been the first ones to, to do so, where we created an app which itself was a way to subscribe to the other apps that, uh, we, uh, that we have. And there it's more of a, you know, it, it's more of a monetization model where you, you are essentially uh, trying to, because it's so hard to monetize already, so once they're, once they're opening up their, you know, their pocketbook, uh, at least, uh, you know, get them, to, get them to subscribe or at least get them to, to or maybe even get a lifetime um, version. Uh, so, but other than that, those are still separate apps. Now, what we've done now is uh, similar to what ABC Mouse is doing, where it's, it's one app, but it's this, you know, huge world of, of activities. And that's a different, that's a completely different animal uh, largely because, and this is, this is big, it allows you to have a notion of a, of a world and a notion of, uh, of, of adventure, a notion of progress, and, um, and that makes all the difference, right? So, so these are not just activities, but rather it's an adventure, and, and, and this is what really what we are focusing on now, is introducing different you know, pets, different toys, uh, different monsters, different types of uh, you know, transportation types, to make it feel like a real world and not just a you know, glorified you know, map that's just tying all the activities together. So that's really the, the main, uh, I think the main difference is that you, you, you're able to create a, a world um, and, and that's something that kids you know, definitely uh, appreciate more because it, it allows them to, to role play in a sense which is not really the case uh, when you have you know, a bunch of disparate um, apps. Um, also, it makes it easier, to be honest, to, to uh, release uh, new activities, right? When, you, when you're building an app, an app itself needs to consist of you know, at least four activities, 
Whereas if you just have this, uh, you know, have this uh, subscription-based uh, world, so anytime you have an activity, you, know, so you just plug it in and, and it's ready to go. And it also gives you a, uh, on one hand, style can be, you know, restricting, but also it's, it gives you a sense of, and sometimes, you know, limits are, you know, give you, can, can really, you know, open things up more for you than, than not having limits. By, by, by having everything be cohesive and fit into a certain style, that kind of drives your future activities and also forces you to maintain a certain level of quality. Um, when, when, you know, when, when uh, you, you have some activities that are great, but, but some are not, that's, that's not a good experience. So it forces you to make sure that all, everything that you're releasing is, is, is top notch and represents the same quality as your you know, most quality uh, apps. So, so that's, what we've, uh, that's what we've seen. And, and, and of course, the, the ability to just um, you know, get, it all, uh, get it all at once uh, and uh, you know, get, get a loyal customer that you will be able to uh, monetize as long as you're doing a good job, uh, giving him, you know, giving g giving their child what to, uh, you know, what what to do and what to grow with. Uh, so, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, Mr. Sammy, um, as you mentioned, uh, Big Bang Racing was not ex exactly designed for kids, but uh, you knew that it'd be a family probably that would use the game. Because um, I think a lot of things about the game are very attractive to uh, to, to children. Uh, but now, with that saying, with that said, uh, you do have a free-to-play uh, monetization uh, model, um, and of course, you can go into that a little bit. But the whole idea there is it's kind of hard to monetize. Nor do I actually support generally monetizing kids in a free-to-play model. And so, um, what have you found out regarding um, monetizing families? I, I guess. To have the free-to-play model work, you need to have the parent, of course, uh, approve any in-app purchases. So have you kind of addressed that in certain ways, or, um, or I guess how would you do things differently um, if you were to focus more on a kid's um, user base as opposed to more of a, a general user base? Um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it's true that uh, user-generated content-based games seem to attract kids. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> actually, 36% of our players are under 15. So, uh, and and uh, from the 8 million levels, uh, 4 million are made by the players that are under 15. So, so uh, the creation elements are are huge. Um, from the monetization perspective, uh, since the game is uh, created for the for the general audience, um, adults also. Uh, and it's a racing game. It's uh, concentrating on on, on uh, upgrading the vehicles to perform the best possible way. So so uh, speeding up the car, making the suspension work better, and so on. And it's physics-based game, so it's a little bit hard to control. So so if I would be uh, targeting it for kids, I would make it e more easy to drive, maybe, and 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 change the uh, change the the performance upgrade system into, into a collection mechanics, as, as kind of uh, discussed earlier also. And one interesting thing in, in, in user generated content is, is that, uh, that uh, uh, in social media, uh, you cannot really uh, monetize the creation part, but, but uh, there are some, some uh, strategies that you can, you can uh, apply to, to uh, uh, concentrate the monetization on the on the on the creation content creation and uh, by limiting the the parts that you can uh, add to your tracks and 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 selling these kind of uh, creation packages. So this is this is what I would do if I would kind of uh, target it uh, solely on the, on the kids. Excellent. And then uh, Michael, uh, regarding also game design and uh, monetizing, um, you know I, I really respect. Um, individuals and companies that are able to like reinvent themselves with everything that they ship. And as I believe most of your products are quite unique from each other, different gameplay, different monetization models, um, you know, that, that requires constant uh, reinvention and also constant testing. And, uh, but also it shows, you know, pride in what you guys have built. I mean, that's, sorry if that sounds too much like an endorsement, but, uh, but the point is like, how, how do you actually find um, the best way to monetize a certain gameplay? Are you always, you know, you start with, okay, this Thomas and Friends um, 
train game, do you know immediately what the best monetization model would be for that type of game? Or are you still experimenting with every new gameplay? Well, we definitely we do, we do a ton of experimenting with every with every app or possibly with different gameplay because it's it's not a an exact science. But certainly there are learnings from one app to the next, even though the apps might be very different from one another. Um, we are constantly making different apps because we are building a portfolio and, and nobody wants to get the same thing twice, really. So we're we're trying to, you know, take every opportunity to create something new that that our audience doesn't yet have. Um, however, one, one monetization model that, that we've used more than any other is, is not uh, what you would call free to play, but it's, let's say, free to try. Um, and many of our apps, even though they're very, very different from one another, will, will monetize this way. So the app will be free um, with a limited amount of content for you to try it. Um, and then we will upsell more content to, to do it. So in the example of the train set, you'll get, you'll get a couple trains and a bunch of pieces of track that you could put together and, and be creative and make it. But if you want to get different characters and different sort of unique pieces and stuff, we'll sell that in content packs and limit the amount of, so you could just unlock the whole game at once like you would at a toy store. The only uh, difference between a toy train set and that is that we actually give you a few pieces of train uh, set for free, which you can never do in a real world uh, toy because of the, the cost of the, of the actual toy. But we are able to digitally give a little bit away for free for you to try and then just buy it out completely. Um, so it's not one of these sort of recurring in-app purchase situations where you know, you're, you're, you're buying boosts and so on to, uh, to go through a, an addictive loop and keep monetizing. It's just you're trying something and then unlocking the rest of it for, for a set amount. Well, it's interesting because um, for the longest time, at least at the beginning of uh, our space here, it was premium apps. That means you charge two ninety nine, and then that's it. You can no longer monetize that user. Um, and then if you had a paywall, you get a whole bunch of installs, but maybe only 5% convert to paying $2.99. So now you're looking at like a 12 cent per user sort of thing. But now uh, it looks like you guys are doing really cool things with um, figuring out these new business models where it's free, but then if you want some more uh, track, you, you, know, you can pay, of course, if you want more. And then just adding more content. So now it's like a game as a service now that you guys are kind of offering. Uh, which I think is incredible. I, I think you know uh, uh, more kids, games, and apps need to be more inventive with uh, the monetization uh, as you're doing. And so I think that's Thank a you. great learning example. Thank you. Because um, yeah, of course you know we're up here all day talking about how difficult it is, but I think it does require just creativity, trying new things, and it's definitely possible to uh, to really take off. Um, Christine, and so I think the last you know for a while you know uh, especially in 2017, there's been a lot of news reports of. You know, uh, these games are so addictive, which is true. I mean, obviously, these free-to-play games, for the most part, have these loops that, you know, really uh, require you to, um, you, know, uh, you know, engage with advertisements or, or pay in-app currency. Um, but, you know, ABC Mouse clearly is using game design for, for good, for good purposes, which I think is also underutilized. Um, and so maybe, can you tell me a little bit more about yeah, how game design is being used within uh, ABC Mouse for making sure the kid is actually progressing and learning and developing? Um, so for us, our core loop might be have slightly different goals, but we still have a core loop like uh, all you guys probably have as well. Uh, it's just wrapped with learning wherever we can push it in, right? Um, so our core loop is basically learn, earn, and then play. And so we've got about 9,000 activities that have been created by our, um, you know, our scope and sequence that a, a child can either go through on a, st a structured learning path or just free play in general. Um, they have the opportunity as they complete those activities to earn tickets. Those tickets they can then um, use in a shopping area and get a little, throw a little math in there. Uh, do you have enough tickets to buy the things that you want that they then can use um, in the sort of what we call well, more like a free play area, uh, whether that is their room or taking care of a hamster or those kinds of things. So there's learning opportunities there as well. But they're really incentivized to um, really show their agency and autonomy in those areas and, and also continue to grow. Um, yeah. So it's same same sort of different different thing, but same sort of thing. I'm sure that these guys go through as well. Yeah. yeah. I love the whole idea of um, you know every opportunity is I think a potential learning opportunity, um, and so of course even you know the last couple of weeks with you know, Apple and their um, activist shareholders discussing how 
uh, negative and uh, potentially addictive screen time is for kids. Um, yes, but also we need to therefore focus more on the quality of that screen time. And you know, so thank goodness for uh, our, our friends up here that are creating quality content for the screen and, and using game design uh, for, for great purposes. And, and again, you know, look, screen time can actually be learning opportunities. It's just a matter of what the content is being engaged with. Um, so now, UGC. Um, so I think you know, a lot of the games that we've been speaking about here thus far, um, you know, the, the development cycle has to be relatively short, I, th I think. But now, uh, Sammy and his team at uh, Traplight have been spending a few years, you know, building out uh, their user-generated content uh, engine and, and your physics engine and your in-house social media sort of thing. Um, so UGC clearly also has been very um, powerful for, for kids and, and very uh, like a, a favorite uh, gameplay, uh, looking at uh, like Roblox and, and Minecraft. Um, and so. But at the same time, if, if you cannot control the content, you know, if the users are actually controlling the content, how do you ensure it remains to be a safe place for, for kids? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's true that uh, user turn content uh, with the higher player autonomy <coughs> invites some individuals to explore their self-expression in a, in, a, in a places that we or the player community doesn't up, uh, kind of uh, appreciate necessarily. Um, <coughs> Our strategies uh, handling those offensive uh, content are basically <coughs> uh, well, basic strategies, strategies with the, with the uh, uh, player names and clan names and, and names of the tracks. We use bad word filtering on those, but uh, the real beef is, is uh, that we trust our players uh, to rate the content, uh, find out the good tracks, and uh, upvote those. And at the same time, they, they uh, report any offensive content. Uh, uh, we don't distribute that, that, uh, any content to general audience before it goes through this, this community uh, modifi uh, uh, kind of a rating uh, and, and check up. So there are like a, uh, several play times on each level before it goes to the uh, main progression path. So, um, <coughs> uh, there are, uh, because of that, there is uh, extremely few cases of offensive content in a, in a game, actually. Uh, uh, I think the more kind of uh, what we have been dealing with is, is the social media part of the game. So, so since it's a kind of a uh, in a in a Facebook, you post uh, uh, post uh, different kind of uh, things uh, like like comments and and, and uh, pictures and so on. In our game, players post tracks, and uh, and uh, it's uh, you receive likes for those those tracks, and 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 people can follow you, follow the creators, and uh, and uh, this kind of uh, um, opens up a, a kind of a social media experience for the kids. At least, uh, kind of a, it might be the first social media experience. For for an eight-year-old, for example, and uh, what we have been seeing seeing is uh, that the, there are lots of parents and grandparents playing with their kids and uh, and uh, introducing them uh, uh, to, uh, the social media part for the for their kids, building together. Uh, usually, it starts so, so that the parents create easy tracks for their kids because the general level of the of the difficulty is too high for the, for them. So they start doing this, and, and, the, and the kids start also creating the levels. And then the parents help them to create levels. And, and, and for, for an eight-year-old, for example, it's a huge deal to get 100 likes for the, for, for the content that they have created. So it's a, it's a kind of a powerful experience for both parent and the kid together to create something that kind of receives a positive social validation, in a sense. Uh, we also have a... <laughs> have a uh, uh, um, people tell us uh, weird things uh, in, a, in a support, so, so it's kind of a... Uh, we have also divorced parents uh, spending time with their kids inside the game on their off weeks, and they don't, cannot physically see them. Uh, the kids, uh, they, they create levels together. They, they kind of uh, they form clans in order to, to share and, 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 and compete with each, uh, each other. So kind of a, uh, even though there are these, we cannot control everything, there is a high amount of, uh, of community moderation 
And since we trust players to create the content, we also trust them to kind of uh, tell us what's good and what's not for, for the community. And we just gave them tools. And maybe that, that's why it took two years to create the game. But it's, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a, a social media platform at the same time. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking the answer in that direction. You know, I didn't mean to, like, you know, how do you make sure that kids are safe on UGC? But uh, I mean, the opportunity and actually what you guys are experiencing is really incredible. You know, being able to uh, make sure that parents are engaged with their kids' screen time. You know, um, you know the uh, American, um, I always get you know, AAP, um, the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, thank you, memory. Um, definitely suggest, you know, more important than limiting screen time, more important than the content is actually the parents' involvement with their child's screen time. And I think something with uh, UGC uh, is allowing a platform for kids and parents to actually interact, which I think is really cool. Um, and I think the, the big deal in that is that they can do them uh, do it with their own devices. So they, they are not restricted on, on one device. So the parent doesn't need to be restricted on, the, on a kid's uh, progression and, and, and the other way around. So, so you can kind of uh, play the game together through the social, uh, social mechanics of the game, but it's kind of a, kind of a, a different progression path. Okay, and so I think we have about 15 or even 10 minutes, and so I want to uh, just jump into marketing pretty quickly. And so, um, Alex, uh, if we can start with you here. Um, you mentioned like when you first started, you know, uh, it was easy or it was at least beneficial to have a great relationship with the platforms uh, for featuring. But a lot of things have changed in the App Store. Uh, global featuring is not so common nowadays, especially now that there's a design for families category in Google Play, for example. Um, and so how, how do you continue to, um, to, to market? Uh, obviously, paid advertising does not work for almost 99% of uh, those in our space, and so I assume you're maybe not doing a whole lot of that. You're saying ASO is more difficult because uh, the search terms are being you know, fought over by you know, many other apps at this point. So yeah, what, are you, what are you guys working on these days to, uh, to really market, or try to market? That's an uh, excellent question. Um, yeah, I mean, like, like, like you said, it's, uh, the, the challenge of monetization has always been there, but the user acquisition challenge is more recent for us. Um, recent being maybe the last uh, three years or so. Uh, until then, between Google featuring us and our own app cross-promotion, we were able to push just about any one of our newly released apps into, into the t very top of the charts in, in, in the kids uh, and educational sections. Um, it's, it's, it's a problem that doesn't have an easy uh, solution, um, largely because the ideal way to be able to, uh, to solve it would be to get to the point where the lifetime value per user exceeds uh, what it costs to acquire that user. And at that point, it might you know, just become a cash flow problem, which is much easier to solve um, then if the math simply doesn't, uh, you know, th th that doesn't work. Uh, so our ultimate goal is to um, follow uh, what, you know, what we believe, <laughs> and Christine would know this uh, better, but uh, uh, we believe that ABC Mouse uh, has been doing some things right, um, and that is that their campaigns, their user acquisition, uh, their TV campaigns, so to me, it, it feels like they serve a dual purpose. It's not just about user acquisition, but it's also about establishing the brand and the necessity to get the product to such a point where you, users feel compelled almost like, like I'm doing something wrong if I don't get this because my child is not going to be ready for, um, for, for school. So it's, it's broadcasting this message in such mass, in, in such uh, volume, that it can't be ignored, and at that point, you're not just getting individual users, you're establishing yourself as a, almost a household brand, at least in this, uh, in this space, and you're creating a, a kind of, almost like a category. It's no longer just, you know, you're making kids apps, you're making education apps, but it's a kindergarten preparation, you know, program. It's a first grade preparation program, and you're not ready for first grade un unless you, you know, you get this. Uh, that's our, you know, frankly, that's, that, that's, that's our uh, analysis uh, of, of what I think ABC Mouse is being very successful in. So it's almost like getting to that critical mass, but to get to the critical mass, you, you do need to get your KPIs uh, to the point where 
where you can get that kind of money, where, you know, w where somebody would be willing to give you the money to, to put in, in this level of, of advertising. Um, so right now we are kind of hunkering down and focusing on our KPIs, on our funnel, on our conversion. We're trying to get to a point where the, uh, the lifetime value per user at least is a, uh, you know, is, is, is close enough to the acquisition cost where if we uh, had the, you know, where we also had kind of the, the broadcasting, the volume effect, uh, where we could just, you know, drop a chunk of money on, 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 on advertising, um, the, the, then, uh, the, then we could at least begin to address the, the user acquisition, uh, both the user acquisition and monetization problem. So, so, so it's really a matter of solving both hand in hand. So like I said, right now we are really hunkering down on, 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 on quality, on our, on our KPIs, on, on, on the conversion, uh, and also talking to potential marketing uh, partners. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's, that's what's going on. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea here is um, there's a lot of different ways to market, but uh, you realize that uh, for your company right now, you need to really focus on product, uh, work on those metrics, and then you do want to invest in paid UA uh, once you're ready uh, with those metrics. Yes, because that, that's really the way to, 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 to scale and to not be dependent on the mercy of, of Google uh, featuring or on, you know, on uh, pre-installations or other ways of monetization, which basically involve, they are free, but, but the, you, just a matter of you know, basically making nice to, to somebody that's going to be kind enough to, uh, to feature you, as opposed to you know, buying your way in, which, which, uh, which works, which inevitably works if you, get, if you can get the math right. Excellent. Okay, now, um, Michael, uh, you guys have uh, like 500 million installs. Did I read that right? So obviously that's no small feat, especially for our uh, space, right? And so you were able to do this, um, I guess, through what tactics? I mean, what you say, you know, from, from the get-go, uh, were you really focused on working with the best uh, IP in the space? And because you knew that this space is very difficult, so you better have some sort of uh, marketing angle to begin with. Um, or are you also relying pretty heavily on some other uh, marketing channels? Well, um, we, we don't want to rely on any single channel. Um, we want to be diversified. So, for example, getting featured by uh, the app stores is not a, a strategy, but it's certainly um, an opportunity that, that you, want to, you want to take advantage of. But um, you certainly wouldn't want to build a business that relied on that strategy because, of course, that's not something you have control over. Um, so, yes, um, one of the biggest things we do, obviously, is partner with, with brands. Um, and that is um, massively important for a variety of reasons when it comes to acquiring new users. One is the organic search uh, aspect of it because um, often um, one of the most important ways to, to acquire users is, is using the, the search on the app stores. And one of, the, one of the things that people will search for is their favorite characters. So there's no question that it, uh, has a lot to do with, um, with how we've achieved this uh, number of volume. But it's not that and that alone. Um, once you do have somebody into our portfolio, it's, it's just as important that we keep them in our portfolio and, and cross-promotion becomes a massive part of our strategy. Uh, and we've done all types of um, things around cross-promotion um, and tactics, which we can, I can speak to anybody about afterwards in more detail. But, but certainly, when, once you've searched for your favorite character, we want to make sure that you know, we now have an opportunity to uh, show you all of our products as well. So that's been huge. Um, getting featured has also been big for us, uh, and that is done um, in a way that has multiple uh, values, which is making a great app. Uh, in other words, you will get featured not just by sort of making nice with, with people at app stores, but more importantly, because they are honestly going to feature apps that uh, they feel bring a lot of value to their users. Um, we've certainly made so many apps that we know if we, we can beg all we want and we can do it, but if it's, if it's not um, a, a, just a great app, and also if it doesn't use some of their technologies, which is something that they certainly want to um, 
you know, work with you to help promote. And those are technologies that are often really great for the end user. So ultimately, if you're taking advantage of new technology and making a great app, then, then that's another uh, angle to it. And then, of course, building your own brand and making great products is going to make people want to get more of your other great products. So uh, I think the way that we've achieved that, that much volume is, is a mix of working with, with great partners and also really just trying over and over and over again to make apps that, that parents and kids absolutely love uh, and that they want more of from, from our portfolio. Great. And then a quick follow-up. I'm, I'm sure everybody in the audience is like, okay, great. I would love to work with some awesome IP because it uh, sounds like it's going to be quite helpful for our business. But then they go to you know, Mattel and they send up Barbie tomorrow. Is that how it works? I guess not. And so what do you recommend for those out there that want to work with this IP? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a great thing to do. Um, and it's not, it's not rocket science to get into it. In order to work with the kids' um, IP, um, one of the biggest things is that that IP owner wants to know that you're going to represent it really well and that they can trust you. Um, so you need a track record to do that. Uh, the way that I suggest doing that is not necessarily going after the world's largest IP as your first attempt. <clears throat> you know, but if you can get in with a company that's, that's hungry, that does have a brand, um, but, but maybe doesn't have as many uh, publishers looking to do licensing deals with them, um, if, you, if you do a, a deal that's really favorable for them and, and do something with them, it may not bring in everything that a, a big IP would, but what it would do is then you know, show that you're able to take somebody else's creative assets um, and represent them really, really well. And then, honestly, it will be a snowball after that if you've done a good job. Thank you. And now our last question. Um, so we can think about your own uh, questions. I think we have a couple of minutes for that. Um, so yeah, Sammy, I think all the features within Big Bang Racing, and I believe your um, future projects, have you know, many aspects to it that I think make it quite easy uh, to maybe go viral, or at least if, if a user shares their gameplay. I think it's very exciting to, to share with their friends and that sort of thing because of the physics engine and the UGC aspect. Um, and so how much are you guys relying on um, you know, trying to make things go viral? How much are you relying on YouTube and other uh, social media platforms for your users to share with, with their friends? Yeah, um, well our, our kind of a main marketing uh, strategy is to use the influencers, YouTubers, uh, and, uh, and rely on, on players uh, uh, sharing content that they have created because, because it's kind of a kind of a uh, natural for people to share what they create um, we run this this uh, um, uh, on a concrete side we run these these creation challenges that we 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 feature them in social media in in, in Facebook and Twitter and uh, and we usually have a youtuber who streams uh, the, the, the competition goes through the best best entries and and, and uh, participates in a, in a selection of the of the of the of the winners and those winning winning tracks then go to our live ops events uh, which are kind of a, a, a tournaments where you compete against other players and uh, and uh, that again usually uh, is involved with the youtuber so so um, uh, Either the track is made by YouTuber or by us for the YouTuber, or or it's it's through these competitions over there, and this is this is something something that that kind of is the uh, highest uh, uh, state of uh, social validation that we can offer from the game. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of players are kind of uh, kind of uh, playing the, that your track, and uh, YouTubers are kind of nitpicking uh, all the all the bumps and, and and how how do you make a good time in that track? And so they are. It's uh, your track is getting uh, your con content that you created is getting lots of attention. So we have lots of kids uh, sending us messages that hey, can you feature my level in the in a next tournament? Please, please, please. Can 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 you do it? So it's kind of a uh, that uh, that kind of uh, kind of uh, 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 influencer relations. Uh, we also take influencers into account on creating uh, features that it's easier for them to to kind of uh, stream our content in the future games, uh, especially. And um, and uh, well, I think the, since you mentioned the, the physics uh, physics engine. Uh, Having a physics in a game is usually uh, it creates emergent fun. Uh, of course, it's 
creates some problems also, uh, especially on the monetization point. <laughs> but but uh, it's kind of a kind of a, uh, um, uh, Apple seems to like uh, content that is created uh, in the game by the player community, and 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 combined with this crazy physics thing, it's uh, maybe that's because they so chose the Big Bang rating to be a best of 2016, one of those titles, uh, and. Maybe one reason was that uh, it's uh, very family friendly uh, from the graphical point of view and from the from the social media point of view. That's great. I think a lot of um, you know developers have the idea. I need to reach out to uh, influencers, you know, YouTubers, and have them promote my game, my app. Well, it's like, well, what's in it for for them necessarily? But what you're doing though, you're making it like a really great symbiotic relationship between you, your users, and the YouTube channel. You're, you know, you're having live tournaments. You're engaging your users. You're getting followers for the YouTuber. The YouTubers having fun. Cause, I mean, it is a lot of fun to play. And so I, I think it's great that you know, obviously, use your creativity to figure out the best way to, you know, really kind of grow your user base. And have you spent like any paid UA on, on your users, or has it been all uh, the love from Apple as the top or one of the top games in 2016? Yeah, we have been very uh, fortunate on a, on a, on a. Uh Featuring side, uh, uh, both Google and Apple have been uh, uh, featuring our app. Uh, what we have been doing is uh, to concentrating on a, on a, on a YouTubers. We have uh, used uh, uh, tried some some paid um, uh, campaigns also over there. But uh, what we have seen is that uh, when the YouTuber actually wants to create content for the for the game and 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 and, and, and we. Uh, we give perks for them to give out uh, for their fans inside the game. So we create, for example, hats uh, that they can. Uh, uh, if you start following this YouTuber inside the game, you get that hat. So they can they can actually actually uh, uh, activate their their fan base inside the game. So so this is these are the kind of other actions that we have been on concentrating on 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 user acquisition. Like uh, we, um, uh, annoying orange made made few videos and it brought lots of lots of kids uh, kids to our game and it's uh, it's uh, very important to find the right kind of a youtubers for the, for the great well I think that's uh, the session here this morning and now um, we do have I think two or three uh, minutes for, for questions um, and so who may have the first question uh, Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, William, for really great questions because they made a lot of sense for me. And my question to panelists will be, so we are a new, let's say, a new company, the kids' niche, a new application, an educational one. And when I start talking to people how they actually get in here and how they got their apps somewhere on top positions in uh, Google Play or App Store. So there are usually two answers. The first one is we launched our first app somewhere in 2010. So we have been on the market for long. And the second one, we got the featured. We, we, we've been featured. That's it. That's the story of our success. So I wanted to ask if you have some recommendations for new app developers in terms of user acquisitions that entered the market right now. Well, I, I, Alex mentioned something earlier which I agree with, which is uh, paid acquisition is certainly um, one that one can do. And, and the way that you get there, um, which is a good challenge, is if you make a, a really great app and you have chosen a proper monetization method, if you can get just 100 people um, to play it um, and you're getting a good lifetime value from that user, then, like he mentioned, it becomes a cash flow problem. You say, well, look, we make $5 and we can acquire them via this channel at, at $3. So, you know, there's, that's, a, that's a problem that's very solvable with all types of financing solutions that exist in the world. So that's one way that I would recommend going about uh, user acquisition um, where you're not relying on getting featured because that's just not a strategy, like I mentioned. Um, and, and I think that ultimately that's what we need to do is, is make apps that uh, that can monetize by providing a lot of value so if you've solved that then acquiring users won't be a problem because you're you're going to be making money and then you can afford to advertise we call it user acquisition I, I also call it advertising you know we're just you know you're, you're spending money to tell the world whether it's putting a big banner on a uh, a billboard on, on the highway or a television commercial or a paid um, mobile app campaign they're all variations of a theme which is you know, spending money to let people know how 
what your product is, how to find it, and how great it is. Um, and you'll have all the money in the world to do that if you can just monetize an individual uh, at a good uh, lifetime value by giving them something they're willing to pay for. In order to uh, enable, to, uh, in order to be able to uh, do the paid acquisition, you of course have to have a good enough LTV for for the for the acquired users. So otherwise, you are just spending your money on a, on a user that might spend like seven days in your game and then leave uh, and not spend anything. Uh, but uh, what, uh, especially for new companies, uh, I would recommend uh, good relationships with uh, with uh, Google and Apple. Uh, go talk to them, listen to what they have to say. Featuring, yeah. So it's kind of a kind of a um, even even small featurings uh, help quite a lot. So uh, uh, and uh, it doesn't happen if you if you don't kind of uh, understand what they want. So so it's a, it's a, go and talk to them and and and, and uh, of course. Uh, they want to uh, want you to implement this and that and those features, but there are more to it than that also. Just have a question here. Yeah, at the end of the day, I'm sorry. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it's a business, right? And so it's like you know, like entrepreneurs think about what problem is there in the world that needs to be solved that has enough value that people are willing to pay for. So I mean, if you're creating an app or a game that is just like something else and it's kind of hard to differentiate what you're doing, then you know, maybe you should you know, just spend more time uh, until you have that golden opportunity of an app or a game that most certainly fills a need and people are willing to pay for. And Google and Apple are willing to say, wow, I definitely want to support you guys because it's providing value to our users, it's providing us uh, economic value. Um, so maybe yeah, before, I mean, definitely search for that sort of product. Yes, uh, real quickly, the prior session had some uh, comments on uh, rating systems for kids and COPA requirements and such, compliance. Can a couple of you just comment briefly on how you've addressed that specifically at your companies and how deeply? Yeah, well, I think for, first for Sammy, you know, they're focused more on families and general audiences. They're not so focused on this sort of thing, I don't, I don't think. But of course, you want a rating that says, we are uh, suitable for all ages. I think that's the rating that you're, you're going for. But um, yeah, otherwise, other Sure, I'll, I mean, we think about it very deeply. Uh, we work on it very hard. Uh, so as far as how do we know that we're, you know, what are the efforts we go to to make sure that we're COPA compliant, uh, other compliant with other things and, and appropriate. Uh, we have an in-house legal staff that um, consults on everything that we do. Uh, they play every single, internally, they play every single release and update that we make of any of our apps. We have a QA team that is also very aware of all the things that we are uh, trying to avoid and all the guidelines that we're trying to adhere to. We then also work with third parties like ESRB. Uh, there, are, there are others um, that, are, that are great um, who uh, consult on this and, and can give you certification. Um, uh, I highly recommend doing that. Um, so in other words, both. You, you don't want to just rely on a third party. Um, you also don't want to just rely on yourself. You also just have to keep up to date because there's uh, constantly new, new regulations coming into play. Um, I, that's my quick answer. <laughs>